to all my playboys out there and everybody else that's tuning in man i appreciate all the subscribers all the likes and all the support before i get into today's into today's subject i want i want to address the the issues that i've been bringing up one like i said i've been reading all the comments on my youtube and everybody else's youtube regarding my name well first of all if you're not a writer and you don't know the intricacies of our policies and our procedures and what takes place I mean, you can speak on it if you want. You can talk bad on me, call me this, call me that, go believe that individual. Even, you know, even most of you guys that talk about that individual don't even know that individual in particular. But like I said, if you got something to say, instead of leaving it in the comment section, like I said, you're more than welcome to do a video just like this, and I'll submit it and post it on my YouTube. So everybody can see your face and hear what you got to say. And then I'll counteract it with my argument and rebuttal everything that you have to say about me whatever it is don't be shy we ain't being shy me and ebk ain't being shy we putting our face out there for those that want to hear us and hear our stories with that being said i want to talk to you today about um eddie crackers vindiola from fresno and my first encounter with this individual when i was active as a norteño soldado and you know i was high in the ranks on the on the on the active side we used, i used to read a lot of of the, of the of the history about this individual you know he was there when he booked cheyenne when come to find out that he was he wasn't really there he didn't take place but you know it's it's, it's just history it's fairy tales and that's what we're led to believe and the story is before i i, I actually because i talked to him personally and asked his side of the story but the story that we're told and brainwashed to believe is that this individual just rebelled against the nf while he was an nf due to the fact that he didn't want to he wanted to control all of fresno in the historia it says that him and his brother indio were taxing their own youngsters that were coming from fresno and punking them and making them pay rent taking their canteen and whatnot and when the nf decided to get involved and tell them that they need to stop the oppression they rebelled and speared two nfs on the tier and that's how the branch off with the fresno bulldogs took place so in 2012, after I got removed off the yard, I was in Sad FC yard, building seven, when this took place. I go to the hole, I go back, try to regain my status, got removed again. And in about a nine months transition, I was they, the administration, the ISU and IGI said that we can no longer put you on that yard due to the fact that they already know I've been getting hit twice and I'm gonna continue to get assaulted. So I finally hung up the gloves and said, you know what, if they don't want me, they don't need me. So I was on my way to I was on my way to D yard in Sad F, which was the SNY at the time. But during that time, IGI had told me, he goes, Hey, this is the yard you're gonna be going. This is what you need to look forward to. Live your life the way you live your life. I was like, Yeah, whatever, dude. And he goes, Ah, oh, you get to meet your big homie crackers. I was like, Who's crackers? And then when he told me he was the founder of the Fresno Bulldogs, I was like, oh, that crackers. Okay. I was like, yeah, for sure. Whatever, man. It's like, it's not my people. Because, you know, I still had the Norteño mentality. I was just going to go kick it with Norteños. So I land on a, I land in a sad F hole at SAG, pending transfer to D yard. And down the tier for me, for one, was a uh, Rene Boxer Enriquez. You know, the black hand dude. And I'll tell, that'll, be a, that'll be for a later video because I got to inter interact with that dude because he had just got denied parole by the, the governor of California and he was getting transferred to some county jail to, for the appeal. <clears throat> so I spent some months with him in the cages on, on the yard working out, having discussions with him. But the first individu individual that I met was Epi Cortina, which the same individual I did the, um, you know, the whole 60 Minutes nf captain breaking down the the rules and regulations of the organization i started talking to him and he started getting me familiar with the sny side and i was like hey bro is there any homies over there what am i what do i gotta do do i gotta put in some work do i gotta you know lace me up and he was basically saying like well based on the fact that you're from northern california more than likely the northern riders are gonna try to push up on you and recruit you and then he started breaking it down like how the policies work how the yard works how the sny games control everything that if you wanted to do your own thing, go ahead and do your own thing. If not, you're going to gravitate to the people you gravitate to and who you get along with. 
So he put me up on a lot of game. So I first get to D yard building three, and my first celly was a center. He's a two fiver Cinquero from Fontana. So center starts lacing me up, and that's when I finally he introduces me. Since he already seen the north on my back, he introduces me to the homies, to the Playboys, little man from Sac, Playboy from Sac, uh, Maniac from Visa. You know, we were, we were like 18, 19 deep. Bayaso from San Jose. So the, immediately they start checking my paperwork, make sure I didn't snitch on nobody. I passed, I passed the test. So I asked the homies, I was like, hey, bro, what's good, man? You know, I just, I'm fresh off the main line. I still got it in me. I still got the mentality. You know, I feel I, I, have, I have this grudge that they let me go like the way they did, but I could still be an asset. I could still be resourceful. And they did. And I went under, I underwent the process and uh, we went to war with the, with the independent riders at that time. Per Snoop. And, um, well, during that time, everybody was telling me, like, hey, man, have you met Crackers yet? Like, it was a big thing. Like, why do I have to meet him? I don't, I don't get why I had to meet him. But on that yard, he was really somebody. And when somebody, I mean, like, somebody. Well, he was the porter when I got to Five Block. He was a porter there when the homies moved me to Five Block. So finally, I'm at the door, and I'm like, I'm going to check this dude out. I want to see what this is about, man. It's mustache, same mustache. Fool, fool had a Mongolian that was probably like 30 years long because it went down like the, down the back of his lower back to his ass. <clears throat> kept it braided, kept it neat, and like, he was he was clean. He was cleaning the building as a porter, and he had his T-shirt off, and he has a big old NF on his back colored in. And I was like, okay, that's the man right there. That's cool. Well, I'll give it about a month or two. I finally introduced myself to him. He introduced himself back. But the way he introduced himself is like he already knew and expected that I would already know who he was. That's the mentality that man was in. He knew everybody knew who he was. And I think he was proud of that. I'm pretty sure he was proud of that because the way he conducted himself. But he was an old-fashioned dude. So everything he talked low, talked respectful, watched what he say. Dude hardly even cussed. I don't think I ever heard a dude cuss. So... We started talking for a while, but my biggest problem was that at the time I had a girl on the team who used to run into dope for me. But when I was on the active side, a lot of Northerners, they always wanted me to bring in weed. They didn't have the plugs to the, to the white or the black. So I, have to, I used to always have to use the Sureños because, you know, they got connections everywhere. And they used to hook me up. And when I'd, I'd bring it in for them, get a third of it. Then make money for the for the for the for the end souls and then send my money to the payroll, the C payroll in Pelican Bay and Corcoran Shoe. So now I don't have no plug. So I was like, I'm gonna ask this dude. He's from the 559, he's an older cat. Let me see. I mean, he's an older generation. I'm, all of them been hooked on heroin for a long time. And everybody told me he's on this side slamming heroin. So I decided to say, you know what? I'm gonna approach this individual. After I got to know him for a little while, I started talking to him. And hearing his little war stories, he used to tell me how it was back in the day, you know, this carnal and this carnal just arguing over this yard, over this territory, over this region. And he used to just sit the sideline like, oh, whatever. It was always a power trip, you know, they were demographic trips. Everybody was territorial. Everybody wanted this piece of action, that piece of action. So I, still got, I, I loved hearing his stories. But when I asked him about it, I said, hey, bro, what really took place? Everybody says that you guys were just punking your own little homies and they decided to step up and say you need to stop the oppression and you guys rebelled. He said that's not the case. He said what it was is before Fresno Chicano started hitting the facilities, the biggest Chicano car for Northern California was San Jose. He goes, so a lot of the time the NFers were using San Jose members to put in all the work. But when Fresno started getting brigged, they started telling crackers to start using a lot of the Fresno individuals to put in work. And he said he finally reached a point like, well, why is it always the Fresno car putting in work, making all the necessary sacrifices and going to the hole? We have members from Tulare County, from the Farmetto Lands to up north. And you guys keep subjecting us to all these uh, hardships and punishments because we have to go. We have to undergo all the shoe programs, the, the catching the cases, the murders when everybody else could be just as useful. And because he decided to speak up and stand up and speak on behalf of the Fresno car, he was reached, he, he got, he, he was pretty much 
identified as, you know, just being insubordinate. So when he realized that that's the, the route they were taking, he decided to take the first step and blast one of them before they blasted him. And because his brother was his brother, Indio decided to jump in and say, you know what, I'm going to protect my brother. And that's when they came up with the idea that, no, Fresno's going to be his own car. We're big enough. And that's when they adopted the logo. I go, okay, so your story is this, and their story is you're just, you guys were just oppressors. And then he says straight up, he goes, man, they're going to say what they want to say in order to keep you guys believing that Bulldogs are just nothing but dropouts, renegades, individuals that need to be targeted because we actually developed the numbers and took over the city. He goes, they're going to make you guys believe whatever you guys want would need to believe in order to serve them. But that's really the case in my aspects. And I was like, hey, I can believe both sides now because I'm, I'm, I'm neither nor. So I took both into account. I said, hey, that's your story. I respect you for it, man, because you guys took over a whole city and you guys rebelled and you guys became the most hated individuals when it comes to northerners. Like they, you guys are targeted for life. There's no, there will never be a ceasefire on that. So after I got to know the individual, I finally hit him up and I was like, hey, bro, I need you to do me a favor. He said, what? I said, look, I understand you've been gone for a long time, but I want to know if you still have your connects. He's all connects to what? I was like, bro, you used to run the Fresno Regiment, and I know you have a lot of soldiers out there that still look up to you. A lot of these neighborhoods you can still reach out to, but you're in the 559, and so is my girl. I, go, I, I, I can bring anything in, bro. I just need it dropped in their hands. And then he puts, a, he puts his foot on a chair and, like, does this. And he goes, well, what do you want? And I was like, I don't know. What can you get? And he's like, I can get you black. I can get you white. I was like, give me black. Black's an easier market. And he goes, well, what kind do you want? And I was like, what the fuck else is there? Black heroin, Will. I didn't know there were seven different kinds of heroin. Just, shoot, just give me some black. And he goes, no, I can get you some trash, some junk. That's like for 600 an ounce. Or I can get you some high stuff for seven. Or I can get you some good stuff for eight. But if you want that fire shit, it's going to be like 950 almost almost 1000 for an ounce. Hmm. So I started laughing. I was like, damn, I didn't even know they had it like that, bro. First of all, I didn't even know there was a difference in this shit. I just thought it was just black shit. You slam it, you get high, and fuck, you fucked up. So I was like, look, man, give me this shit for, give me this shit for eight. I don't want to have people dying and not pay me my money. And then he stays quiet, and he, has, he just starts brushing his mustache. And he goes, you send it for me, carnalito? I was like, well, what do you mean what's in it for you now? I'm paying for this shit and I'm bringing it in. If you want a couple, I can give you like, you know, eight grams and shit. He goes, this sounds good. It sounds good. Let me give it some time. Well, it took a while. It took like almost a month. And then he finally did it. My girl got to drive to Fresno. Can't tell you who, who and what, but I did it for him twice. But as soon as I gave him his dope, his little eight grams, that boy was never to be seen. I didn't see that food work or none. He was just in the cell. Lit. Every once in a while, I see him come out and get his food and all that, but he was gone. You know, OG Tecatos, you know, that's that's what they do. They get it in their hands, it's over with. And his celly at the time was an NF, ex-NF member named Sharky from San Jose. So they were in there just high as fuck, chilling. And then they let, they, they're the ones they're the ones that actually slid me the book, The Rise and Fall of Nuestra Familia, and I got to read it. They were in possession of that book. And that's how I got to meet the guy. And the, one, the last thing that that individual did for me is, like I said, he was a porter. And at the time, we needed to knock down one of our own Nortenga Rider members, local man from Merced, and I couldn't get out the cell. And they were running uh, Muslim services at the time. And I told him, hey, was there any way you can get this door open, bro? I need to get out there. And like I said, that boy got his juice even with the cops. All he did was just wave at my door CO looked at him, popped the door, didn't even question where I was going. I mean, man, he managed to get me outside, and I went outside and took care of my business and went to the hall, and I wound up getting a chance for the Kern Valley after that. That was the last favor that individual done for me, and then I hear later on down the years that, you know, I guess he passed away from drug overdose, but overall, dude was a cool individual. I didn't like that he whispered a lot, but I'm pretty sure that's because of the shoe terms, you know, they had to whisper through the doors. So he never talked loud, but he was always quiet, took care of his business, didn't associate with nobody. Still look healthy, still look good for an OG, but I just always tripped out on that long ass Mongolian. I was like, damn, bro, that shit's been with you through war. That's, that thing has been there through hella corking shoes and whatever the hell else you've been through. But it was a cool individual, man. He was, he, I like that he gave me that book and I got to read it. 
you know, he did what he could for me. He'd always hook me up with extra food, you know, because, you know, I, once he knew I was the, I was a little dope man, I brought it in for him a few times, you know. I got, I, I got love from that individual. And a lot of the ex-Bulldogs that are on there that still press Bulldogs, they respected him for it, they turned to him for that. But it's just a, it's just what his presence brought. When you knew he was around and just showing up to a yard that I'd never been on and how the CLs talked about him, how the inmates talked about him, and just knowing the historia from, from the NF that I was taught to learn, it's like, man, this is a powerful individual. I don't give a damn if he, he he's SNY and he debriefed and whatever that house he had to do, go to the THU and drop out. Like, you guys can call him whatever you guys want, but that boy is a straight killer, straight hitter. I mean, around that time, he was pretty old, so I doubt it, you know, it, he wouldn't do it then. But you guys can talk all this shit about these individuals that have branched away and done their own thing. But you don't forget the fact that these dudes are still killers. They just finally gave up the lifestyle, the organize, organization in order to just to finally be at peace because they know they're never coming home. So that's how I perceived that individual after a while. Once I got to know him, I was like, bro, he just did his time, bro. He was back then since the, since the 60s, 68, when the actual real war happened that separated the North and South, finally, and gave Northern Chicago as a name. He was there for that. You can't take that away from that, man. I don't care what nobody else says. And based on the fact that he had enough power and influence to create Fresno Bulldogs and take over a whole city to this day is controlled by them and ran by them, that should just tell you the, the, the amount of power that a man can gain and establish from just sitting in a fucking cell. But stay tuned. Like, subscribe, and share my YouTube because my next one, like I said, when I finally read that book, um, the Rise and Fall of Nuestra Familia, I got to meet Lobo from Parlier. He was on the same tier as me. And for those who don't know, he wrote the 497 filter, the 59 filter that made Norteños Northerners and Norteños and Souls and recreated the new generation of Norteño struggle that takes place. I got to meet him, cool individual. And then later on, I'll get into the topic when I when I talk to Enrique Boxer's though arrogant ass and how the first thing he told me about was here, you wanna read my book? And I was like, what book? He's like, The Black Hand. I was like, oh, I heard about that book. It was banned, so I never, got, I, I, never, I never tripped on it, but he shot me the book, I got to read it. And then I, later, once I, once I remembered a lot of the names but Jack Spadia, Jackal, was in Five Block with me. And I got to confront that dude. I got into it, Jackal. And there's a story behind that that you guys might want to hear. It's pretty funny. It's, it's, it's embarrassing, but it's pretty funny. OG did what he had to do. And I got to respect him for, for what he did. But it was a funny story that took place with that Mexican Mafia member. So stay tuned. But that's the story I wanted to share with you guys about Crackers. Because honestly, for an individual like myself that was trying to rise to that kind of power... And I got close, but I didn't make it. I got disbarred from that and got stripped of my status. Oh, well, it is what it is. But to get to meet these kind of individuals, it just reminds you that what men can do. And that's what I'm trying to do now for those that are actually tuning in and listening. It's like, bro, just being in that cell alone, you can create the type of power that you need to be influential. You don't need a leader. That man wasn't a leader. He, wasn't, he was a high-ranking member, but he wasn't a leader. But he stood up and led his people and look where they're at now. They're renegades. They do their own thing. They're their own men. They stand up for what they want. And they didn't tolerate no shit. And that's the power that I want everybody else to see that they have within themselves. Is that we all can do it. So stay tuned. Like I said, subscribe. Hit that button. Like, share. Stay tuned for more, man.